My name is Monk Rowe. I'm very pleased to have Ronnie Zito with me today, along with my good pal Rick Montabano. We're in three different places. Uh, musically, I like to think we're closer together. <laughs> okay, yeah. So you're still playing Chicago, I guess. Yeah, 25, 25 years I've been playing it. <laughs> So it's still going, you know, we closed for COVID uh, for quite a while, you know, like a, oh, a year and a half, you know, and then, it, then it, we went back, you know, they're trying to get New York going. There's more people in New York now, you know, the people are coming back. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a good band, you know, it's like a 13 piece band, all good players, man, all great players, you know. Uh, one of the trumpet players is uh, the trumpet player on Saturday Night Live, uh, Earl Gardner, great cat man. And uh, anyway, that's that's what I've been doing. Ronnie, at what point does the band join, re start rehearsing with the show? And what, what uh, is the, the show at when? Oh, oh well, well the band doesn't come in. I'll rehearse with a piano player and a conductor, you know, uh, they do it that way, which is a drag, no bass, <laughs> you, know, you know, but I mean, it's all technical, you know, as far as, you know, start, stop, start, stop for the, for the, with the cast, you know, it's mostly start, stop for the cast, you know, and then I'll add things, I'll change things in the music sometimes, but uh, the band doesn't come in till the whole band doesn't start rehearsing until uh, maybe five or six days before the first uh, performance. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, you know, that's the way that goes. And are the guys coming in and just sight reading at that point? Or do they well, get well no, no, some of the guys, well, actually, a lot of guys are sight reading because I'm, I'm one of the only originals, me and two other people. Uh, from 25 years ago, I'm I'm one of the only ones, you know, just the three of us that are the original uh, uh, orchestra members, you know. But uh, yeah, new guys come in, and uh, you know, it's it, it's it's quite a, it's quite a process, you know, what, what they go through as far as preparing everyone, you know. Yeah. So, but, Ronnie, years ago, um, Utica has a sort of Broadway theater league and Cats came to town and I happened to meet one of the keyboard players and he said, why don't you come and sit in the pit for one of the shows? So I did. And it's the first time I'd seen that close up. And when they had done their parts, then the keyboard player hits a couple of buttons on his profit five. And then, yeah. he, then he gets out the magazine <laughs> or the book. And he starts not, reading, and everybody's doing that. So not me. <laughs> that's my question. How, no. how do you keep focused? And you've I've, oh, that's the main man. That's the focusing is the main thing. It's like uh, it, it's it, it's it's you, that's the problem. You have to keep keep focusing. And but with me, it's I have so much to do. I'm playing drums. I'm playing percussion. I'm playing some orchestra bells. Uh, uh, you know, I'm jumping around a lot, you know, we're on stage, you know, we, we could see the show, you know, but, uh, but that's like, I, I have to just keep focused, man. It's if, if I start wandering and thinking about like something else, getting my car fixed or something, <laughs> uh, man, you know, four <laughs> bars go by and I go, oops, what, where am I, you know? Uh, you know how that is, yeah. Rick. You know, yeah. oh Rick, how's your son, man? Yeah, he's doing well. Man. Great, great. great. I hear. You. I was talking. I talked to Frank DeVito last last week, and we were talking about him. And it's he's, it's great, man. I know he's a wonderful player. You know, I had always hoped when he first went to New York that I could hook him up with you. Oh, I'm somehow, yeah, I'm out in Jersey here, but yeah, somehow like, he work out with school, and then he was. You know, yeah. started playing right away. And yeah. all oh, it's great. Well, I, I work in New York, but as soon as I'm done, I drive back home 
20 miles away. I'm in a very residential area, you know, a beautiful little town, Oradell, New Jersey. And uh, I've, I've got a great wife, Patricia. Beautiful. She helps, helps me all the time, you know. So, Ronnie, but, when um, I was looking this morning at the top 10 from different years, and if my calculations are right, when you were 10 uh, years old, the top singers in the music were Perry Como, Frankie Lane, Dinah Shore. Yeah, yeah. Okay, six years later, um, Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White, Rock Around the Clock, The Yellow Rose of Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my question is, did what on the radio if anything grabbed you at that time when you were like, in, you know, in the oh, man. well, I, I, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't into real, a lot of pop music at all. My brother, my older brother, Tori, uh, Tori Zito, uh, he, he was into jazz. He's a piano player. And I, I used to listen to his record. He would buy records, you know, and I'd, I'd uh, just just zero in. But there there were some pop records that I really liked, you know, like, uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, well, actually it was Rhythm and Blues, man. That's right. what it was. <laughs> you know, it was really Rhythm and Blues. It was, there was, you know, like uh, Wilson Pickett and those people, you know, in the beginning. Uh, I, I just, I love the, the, the rhythm feel, you know, in those records. Uh, but uh, yeah, Rock Around the Clock and those, they, they were okay, but it was more like, it just struck me as being like country, you know, more country than anything else. But, but it was, it was, you know, I know the people just loved it. And, uh, but, but that's about it, man. I listened to a lot of jazz records when I was like 14 and 15, I was, I was listening to Miles and, you know, and all that, Bud Powell, you know. But you were playing um, gigs around the central New York and the Utica area probably early on. Well, I, I, got, a, I got a gig in Syracuse at Three Rivers Inn. Don McBrew. Where, pardon me? Tom McBruno's place. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Tony Raposo was the leader. Right. And he hired me. And at the time, I had not much experience playing for, for acts, you know, like, and they, they had big names coming in, you know, Tony Bennett and uh, Sammy Davis and all these people. And I didn't play for everyone. I mean, some, you know, most of the big guys had their own rhythm section, you know, so I might sit out and, uh, but then there were other people that came in like the Mills brothers, uh, uh, you know, the McGuire sisters, the four lads, I would play for them, you know, and it was, it was great experience. And Tony Raposo was the leader. And when I went in there, I, I, my reading was like, not, I mean, I was about 17 or 18, you know, and uh, my reading was like, I told Tony, I says, man, I says, like, I don't know, my, my reading, I mean, I, I read music in high school, you know, and in, 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 uh, in band, you know, in the band room and the, uh, concerts, but that was more classical. But Tony said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you knew Tony well, Rick. Yes, yeah, yeah, he was and, great. And I, he said, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll get you through this. Because Tony just wanted me on the gig because he was a terrific jazz player. Sure was. And, and he just wanted to blow. He wanted to play <laughs> on, on the dance sets. Right. You know, he wanted to swing. He wanted to play, you know, some, you know and he, he, he liked the way I played that, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of how I got the gig. But then he started literally teaching me how to read. You know, he'd say, he'd grab a piece of music. He'd say, uh, he said, let me take a look at this. And he goes, or, or he might say, before he would say, take a look at it. He'd say, 
Can you sing ba 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 da ba da ba da ba da? Can you sing that? And I would go ba 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 da ba da ba da ba da. And then Tony would point at the paper and say, "Well, that's what you just sang. It's on the paper." He says, "This is this is you can do this. You just sang it. If you could sing it, you 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 got a good chance of playing it. You know." Right. And, and it was it was like that. It was not, no pressure. You know, he was he never pressured me or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know, Tony Rippon was a great musician. Yeah, he sure was. His brother Joe is still around. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Say hello, please. Player. Yeah. yeah. Did, did you ever have any of the acts that came into Three Rivers, the actual singers, for instance, like tell you to do something different or give you one of those looks like, no, oh. that's not what we want. Oh, uh, they might ask, but but usually they went, and usually they, they talk to the conductor about something like that. And then it come, it might come to me. Uh, they, they the, the conductor will say, Ronnie and, and uh, letter B, they want more quarter note feel, you know, uh, or something like that, you know. Uh, cross stick or something like that, you know, it was, they never addressed the musicians most of the time, you know, uh, it, it was that type thing, you know. Were you, then, a, uh, were you a big deal at, uh, did you go to uh, UFA? Yeah. <laughs> where, okay, so I'm imagining that. Wow. You were a big deal. Well, my family has a gig. <laughs> My, my, you know, it's funny. My family was the, the Zito name was a big deal because my brothers were went to that school, and they'd say, "Oh, oh, oh Ronnie Zito's coming in. Uh, 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 we gotta, we're gonna get another Zito," and that would put me under pressure, man. I'd be like, "Oh no, <laughs> Jeez, you know," because I was the youngest, you know, and. Uh, it was great, though. It was great. We had great music teachers. Ed Hacker, great, great guy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was playing one of the, like one of the, uh, someone paged me at the stage door and after the show in Chicago, and, uh, and I, I go to the stage door, man, and it's Ed Hacker. My old high school teacher, you know, oh, Ronnie. Oh, I'm so proud of you. You know, he was like, <laughs> I said, Wow, I can't believe this. You know, with Ed Hackman. Ronnie, did you did you study with uh, the drum teacher, the Jimmy Wormwood, the Babe uh, something? Well, no, not Babe Costello. No, it was it was it was George Glaskins. Oh. That's who we both studied with. Who oh, was all right? Who was great, man. I mean, he he didn't even you know he didn't know anything about jazz or anything like that or playing a, a drum set. Yeah. But he he really rudimentally he was wonderful, you know. And uh, I still think about him, you know, like the way he did things when I went to his lesson. You know, we would have two practice pads set up, and he, you know, he had a beautiful role. He could play a beautiful role, man. I'm still working on that, you know, <laughs> and I think of him all the time. So yeah. there's a bit of an upstate uh, mystery I'd like to uh, just ask about. Uh, there's Nistico, Romano, yeah. Esposito, Mancuso, Zito. Like, what's that about? <laughs> you forgot a few, Monk. I know. <laughs> Menza, Red Menza, Don Menza. Mel Lewis, Mel Lewis from uh, Buffalo, right, right. Mel Lewis, yeah. Steve Gadd. But is there something in in the Italian household <laughs> that you can point to that um, you know enabled this wonderful crowd of musicians that came out of upstate New York? I, I don't know. I think it was more. Uh, I think we were all like kind of like. It was a brotherly thing. The music made us, uh, gave us a brotherly feeling. And it did, man. When you run into guys, I would run into guys that that I might ju- might have just met that night, you know, 
and within 20 minutes we're like we're tight you know what i mean you know what i mean you get that and feeling like wow, i've known this guy we've known each other for a long time you know it's that was that kind of thing you know when did you meet the mancusos ronnie oh from when i was a kid my 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 uh mancusos were sam mancuso was uh he was like he knew me from when I was like a lot young kid, like eight or nine years old. He knew my family, you know, my brothers, and uh, oh, great musician, man. The yeah. Mancusos were just, he's, he was a huge influence on me, man. Huge, still, still to this day. Yeah. I think, and, you know. I have a couple of recordings of him on guitar. Oh, man. That are. Is that beautiful? Yeah, I mean, it, it was you know yeah. hard, hard to imagine hearing somebody that good. I mean, you know, and, and the thing about Sammy was, you know, when he played the guitar, man, he didn't even he pick he just picked down. Did you know that? Yeah, he, he picked down. Yeah, he and I think he had a he didn't pick down up, down up. You know, he had something with I think his fourth finger where he didn't use it or something was something. Really yeah. And yeah. when he played piano, the thumbs, his thumbs were down. No, the thumbs were off of the side of the. Oh, he didn't use his thumbs. <laughs> he sounded like like a Horace or somebody, you know. Man, I would Just, look over his shoulder. I used to go to his house every Saturday morning. Oh man, have coffee and some donuts, yeah. and then yeah. him and I would go and play, and then eventually Dolores would come in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but exactly he would sit, he'd show me something. Don't do this. Go here. Play this jam. Yeah. Oh man, what, what is it? It's G minor. Yeah, and I'd look at it. I said, "That's not G minor. It's G minor, sort of, but it's got." Like all, Some other you know, all these other things <laughs> around it, you know. So I had to just kind of, you know, figure you know, out. And he, he was he was so impressive to me, man, as a person too, because, you know, he had his own house. Right. Uh, he had a day gig. Right. How about he that? Was, he was a supervisor in some plant or something. Yeah. yeah. And I I just. It, it, and I think about I, I just was this respect, you know, because we he had more than we all had, you know, like I don't mean a lot of money or anything, but a, a way of life, you know what I mean? He he just that that was the way I wanted to live, you know, the way Sammy did. Yes, yes. I I I love hearing this, and it makes me think about the learning process back then and how it gets passed on, like, you know, Rick passed on that kind of thing to me, and, and I didn't even have yeah. to ask for it. It was just like, like you said, like just, watching and listening. It's there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so different from how most, uh, now we we go to universities to get to get. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right, you're right. And there's some great, great schools and they're great, great programs now, you know, uh, music programs that we didn't have. We didn't have access to it. Rick, I, I don't know, you know, well, well, I mean, I'm older than you, so, but I, I I don't remember jazz classes and stuff like that. You know? the books. Like it is now, man, you know. There was, I think there was a book called Bugs Bauer. <laughs> yeah, there was. I remember that name. Something. And that was the only like information, like, wow, yeah. what it's, you know, yeah, and it was uh, yeah valuable <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so, Ronnie, your friendship with Jimmy Wormworth, and I want to ask you about <laughs> the mystery drummer Gordon. Gordon oh, Smith. Gordon, man. Oh, man! Was it Gordon Smith? Gordon Smith, yeah. He was. He was uh, about. Oh, he passed away young, man. Like. 27 or something, 26. Oh my God. But uh, but we, Jimmy and I used to go to a club. It's called one of the clubs. It was Miners? Called, Miners Grill uh, uh, or, Wayne and Jean. Or, or Wayne and Jean. Wayne yeah. and Jean's. <laughs> and it was in the black section, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the music was fantastic. You know, you walk in there and it's just, uh, just 
just great. But the overall feeling was great too in those days, he, even as, as weird as it was then with racially and all that, you know, it wasn't that way it, when we were there, you know, it was, it was just the music and everybody having a good time. There was no like tension or any of that, you know. Uh, but but the music was great, and Gordon was usually playing drums. Gordon Smith, and the first time I heard Gordon, uh, man, I wasn't there. First time I heard him was in another gig with Vic Kirch. Remember Vic Kirch? God, Vic well, Kirch I love Vic Kirch. I just posted a video. Yeah. Uh, and Sal and me go, yeah, son, yeah, playing at Bobby's restaurant. Oh man, three and Vic yeah. played and he sang, he scatted, and yeah, he, he just oh my god, what a great natural fun. musician, natural oh, man, goodness gracious, and and uh, ter terrific. Uh, anyway, Gordon was playing, and I was I, I was about fifteen or sixteen. I think I was with Jimmy. We were just hanging out. And uh, it was like, I couldn't believe the groove and the, 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 the imagination just, to, and people were dancing, you know, it was, it was like, it was the Vic Kirch, you know, that yeah. was the rhythm and blues. It was rhythm and blues more than jazz, you know, but it was jazz, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, Gordon had a way of playing like shuffle and stuff like that, man. That I, that I to this day, when I play the show, we play a tune and I, I just cop that off of Gordon. I just play <laughs> that shuffle, man, that he played. And right. I talked to Jimmy about it. I said, man, I still play that. Yeah. A certain thing with my left hand that he did, that I, I that was so magical that I, I went home and worked on it, you know? <laughs> like, uh, I said, this is, I, I gotta do this. Right. Yeah. You know, when somebody you hear somebody like that, man, and you 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 feel like, uh, oh, I gotta get this. I gotta try to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exciting, man. It's very exciting. You know, oh, he was great, man, Gordon Smith, and a great when, guy, man. When you got tapped to uh, go with with Bobby Darren, yeah, was yeah. there any question about doing it? Did you like? Oh yeah, yeah. I I said to Tony, uh, uh, Bobby asked me, Bobby asked me if I could go with him for six weeks, right, or something like that. He didn't say I want you to be my drummer right away, and he says oh, I, I've got this gig in uh, in Washington D.C. So I spoke to Tony about it, and Tony says, Go, man, go ahead. You're young. You, go ahead, just do it. You know. By that time, I was playing because I was at Three Rivers for about two, three years, and I was playing real good. My reading got real good because you're playing different music every week, you know. So you, you, your sight reading gets better. So when Bobby came in, I just it was easy, man. All I had to do was swing, you know. You know, like he he did want to swing, you know. Uh, Mac the knife had just come out. It just came out. Uh, I didn't even know like uh, how big he was up in Utica. We, I, we didn't really know. When I got to New York, it was on the radio constantly, you know. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, I'm, on, I'm doing the Ed Sullivan show, you know. Oh, my God, man. oh you see, got to get a tux, you know. Yeah. I had to get a tux. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and in, the, in the band, in the Ed Sullivan show, it was Thad Jones in the trumpet section, his right. brother Hank Jones playing piano. They were all on staff, oh, CBS man. staff, man. Those guys were, were like busy in the studios yeah. and a lot of other guys, you know, great, great players, you know. So can but, you, but, can you but I, after I went with Bobby, he asked me to stay with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I did the first gig. He said, no, you want to stay, you know? I said, okay, you know. And I stayed, stayed there for four years. I did it for four years with him. You mind me asking what you, uh, what was your weekly salary when you started with? Oh, Jesus, with Bobby? Yeah. In, in those days? Yeah. Oh man, it was like, I don't know, two fifty a week, something like that. You know. <laughs> that was pretty. And good. I thought, oh wow, pretty good. You know, <laughs> in those days, I mean, it was like 
1960 or 1959, you know, something like that. Ronnie, did you play on Beyond the Sea? Is that you on that record? No, oh, man, that's, I wish it was. Uh -oh. That's Don Lamont, the great oh. Don Lamont, man. Oh my God. I always, I always wanted to know who did those fills. That's Don Lamont. Only Don could do that, man. I, I, he was unbelievable. I got, I got it down though, man. It, when I was with Bobby, I played the same shit, man. I practiced it because I loved it so much. Yeah, you know that I, I. It was one of those things. I said, I got to try to play this. I got to do it. And I, and it was, in, in those days, there was, it was like. I don't know, man. It was like I was more fearless, I think, in those days. Well, that recording, the live concert that you're on. Oh, the 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 Copa. The Copa. Yeah, the Copa Cabana. Yeah. You talked about my son. He he heard that many times, man, because oh, I've seen that recording many times. It's just oh, just it's fantastic, Ronnie. It's a good record, man. Yeah. Matter of fact, it's hard to even listen to anybody else. But you when you listen to that recording. Oh, wow. To listen to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> like in front of listening to the hi hat and the, you know. Oh man. And they weren't they weren't even my drums, man. I used to play on drums like we used to travel all over and, and I'd walk in and I would have maybe my own snare drum. Yeah. And that would be it. I everything else was whatever was there I played, you know. And I was, it was fine, you know, it, it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me at all, man. Mm -hmm. Did you like being on the road? Uh, mm, that's a good question, man. Not particularly. I, I, I liked, like when we were in, loc we had some location gigs, like in Vegas, you know, we were like maybe two, three weeks. Right. Or, uh, or in New York at the Copa, we worked there a lot. That was nice because it, yeah, I'd see my brother, you know, and uh, actually I saw my wife there. I didn't meet her there, but I did see her. <laughs> oh, so is that scene in Goodfellas? The scene in Goodfellas where they walk in. Oh, that's it. Is that's that? It. That's that it, man. I mean, I remember that kitchen, that whole scene. There was a waiter. In that scene, that he's a, he's a real. I remember seeing that guy there. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. I remember that guy seeing him all the time, man. Mm -hmm. And because uh, we were there maybe three, four times a year, you know. Yeah. Because uh, Bobby was hot then. People were. Well, I'll say. You know, he got he got very popular. Yeah. So uh, Vegas, you know, but but uh, yeah, most like. When I was with Woody's band, it was different traveling because we did one-nighters, you know. Uh, that was rough traveling. But on a bus. Yeah, on a bus, mostly on a bus. Yeah. Was yeah. Sal Listico in that band with you? Yes. Oh, yeah, Romano. man. Sal. Uh, Romano? No, it wasn't Joe. Joe Farrow was there a while. And then Frank Foster was on the band, too. And uh, Bill Chase, of course, you know, My great, great uh, yeah. lead trumpet player, man. Wow. And uh, great, great players, man. Tony Leonardi. Yeah. I got him on the gig. <laughs> oh, no kidding. <laughs> I did. I recommended him. The bass player was leaving. I said, get this guy from Syracuse, Tony, <laughs> Tony Leonardi. And they, Nat Pierce was kind of in charge of the band, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, how did you guys, how did you pass your time um, during all that travel on the bus? Oh, we would talk a lot, man, with our music and players, you know, like, uh, did you hear Freddie Hubbard's last record or this or that, you know, uh, and was and then, then we had a little battery driven uh, record player, you know on the bus for a while. It was like a little, it was a piece of junk, man. I think it was made in uh, Taiwan or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, then we'd sleep, we'd try to sleep, man. <laughs> you know, cause we'd get in at maybe five in the, in the morning uh, 
check in then, you know, leave the gig, you know, to get on the bus, try to sleep, and then check in at around four or five, uh, depending how far it was, and uh, uh, then try, get up and try, try to get ready for the gig. But the, 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 that's funny, you know, to me, Woody's band, man, I, I love the gigs that we did when we played like gigs like in a VFW or something like that. It wasn't even a concert. Mm -hmm. It was just the band was hired to play a dance. Yeah. Because Woody, Woody took everything. He took yeah. every gig. I mean, we were, we were doing concerts, uh, uh, big festivals, and then all of a sudden the next day we'd be playing a dance, you know. And, but the band swung when we played for dancing, man. Just great, you know. I, I, I always loved playing for dancing. I don't think that's an experience young jazz players get these days. No. no. Coming out of the no. colleges, we're talking about everybody coming out like every year, another 10,000 great yeah. people yeah. come out. Yeah. I don't know these gigs, the, the kinds that we used to play, you know? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Was... Yeah, recently I was trying to describe... Um... Okay, but you're playing for dancers. You might might start out with a two beat, okay, and then you get going and oh yeah, and then you go into swing and they're looking at me like, <laughs> yeah. what are you, what is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, oh. did you get to a point? Um, you're a young man. Did you ever think about um, <laughs> the future, like? Do I want to settle down? Am I looking for something that's going to put me in one place, like studio work, et cetera? Yeah, well, well, I met my wife, uh, uh, and, and we got married in 65, and that's when I left Woody's band. And I, I, I she's, she's fantastic, you know. I mean, she's like, uh, saves my life, you know. And, and uh, uh, I, I had, I actually, when we got married, I, I got to tell you this story, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, I told Woody I was going to get married. He, you, you what? You what? He says, <laughs> we're sitting at, at a counter in a coffee shop. He says, you're getting married? What? Are you kidding? You know, I said, I said, yeah, we're, we're getting married. Blah, 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 blah. He says, I said, we got to set a date, you know, and, uh, he says, uh, uh, we, we, you, can't, you can't get married on that day. He says, uh, we, we have a big gig with Tony Bennett. He says, you know, you got to do it. You got to do it. Tony Bennett is, 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 the, is on the concert, you know. And uh, he says, but I'll give you a couple days off before. I'll give you a couple of days off before if, you, if we can get the, this drummer from Texas or something. I don't know. Um, Paul Guerrero was his name. Yeah, I remember. And uh, so anyway, uh, we get married that day and, uh, and we have a reception. And uh, now, we, now I got to go to the gig. I got to leave the reception to go to the gig. I still have my jacket on, you know. I think I rented a white jacket. I don't know what it was. And the jack, we leave the place. It's and uh, and my wife has her gown on yet, and she my my we jump in a car, and we go to the gig, which is about was about four, three four miles away from the reception where we were, and. We walk in, and uh, I I just run down the aisle and jump behind the drums, you know. And then Tony introduces my wife. She's sitting in the back, you know. And he, Stand up, you know. Oh, they, he made a big deal out of it that we yeah. just, you know. And, and of course, my brother, my brother was writing for Tony, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote some good good arrangements for him. He sure did. He did. And for Frank. Yeah, Incredible yeah. Stuff. Just to... uh, I miss him, man. Oh, I, He's I, my I, brother. To, uh, so, Ronnie, tell me how many musicians were in your family? 
Because I, oh, I, I, well, well, my father, Artie, my brother Freddie, who was on every band in the world, man, he left Utica when he was about 20. He was on Stan Kenton's band, and Charlie Barnett, all the bands, man. And that was in the band era, you know. And uh, he settled in New York, and, and then he moved to Las Vegas later on. But uh, my father was a musician. My father worked in the Stanley Theater playing bass uh, in the Stanley Theater Orchestra. Wow. That, those were the days where they had stage shows. Mm -hmm. And they, would, they might show a movie, you know, or they'd yeah. have a stage show or just stage shows. Right. And my father loved that gig, man. He loved it. It was like the best gig you could get in, in Utica, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that area at the time. My God. Uh, uh, and then it ended and he was destroyed. Uh. <laughs> that ended, uh, then the, my uncles, I had uncles that were musicians. My uncle Jerry, my uncle Bob, he was a violinist. Uh, my uncle Tony. My uncle Tony was a, he just gigged around. He sang and he gigged around with an Irish harp. Oh, you know? <laughs> and he gigged, he gigged locally around and he, he did okay, you know. And, uh, but they used to bill him as Tony Zito, the Irish harpist. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we'd laugh, you know. So I'd say to my father, what, what did he do? Where did he work? He says, oh, he just went busking around, you know, busking around. They right. used those for terms. My old uncles were all older. My father was older. Right. Old time, you know. I said, how did you get to the gig? When did you get in Herkimer in the, in the winter? And my, my uncle Jerry would say, well, it was by Cutter, Cutters. I said, Cutters? He's sleigh, horse and sleigh. Oh my God. Well, yeah, it was like, you know, 1902 or something. <laughs> I said, Cutters, sleigh in the snow. Yeah, oh yeah. I said, well, what, what kind of band was it? Oh, harp and violin. And uh, it's a harp and violin and uh, uh, maybe a, 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 some mandolin or something. Or, right. you know, some, some, like, and they played old music, man. They played like turn of the century music. Yeah, uh, they were older. My my uh, my father was older, and my uh, they they played like uh, you know things like Nelson Eddy. Remember Nelson Eddy? Uh, and Jeanette uh, McDonald. <laughs> that's way back. Yeah, and guys, you know, like um, uh, Jeanette McDonald. Uh, all those beautiful music. It was beautiful music, man. Right. Beautiful, you know. But the, that's what that's what they did, and uh, yeah, there were there were everybody. We always played. There was always something going on. Uh, you know, there was a string quartet in the front room, and uh, and a little. We lived in a little A-frame house. There was no room really, you know, yeah. on Seymour Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which is gone now. It's a parking lot, you know. Wow. And. Uh, uh, but there was always music happening. You know, my brother was always playing or, or there was a trio or a singer would come in and rehearse tunes with Tori, you know. Uh, remember the Lafayette Lounge? Yes. In Utica? Yes. Tori used to do a single there, mm -hmm. you know, before he le ever left Utica. He used to play, play the piano by himself and accompany singers. All these singers would come in, you know. Well, your brother was, uh, you know, amongst the piano players in the area. He was uh, like an icon, of course. Oh, he was, he was wonderful. Man. Especially yeah. because the story is you could put any piece of music in front of him and oh, he yeah, could yeah, sight yeah. read anything from he classical to, music. To he, used to sight read, he used to sight read scores, man, of classical music, you know? Oh my God. Like, like, like when he was a kid, when he was about 16, he used to, on Sundays, he would sit at, at, the, at the kitchen table with the radio on with these scores. He had miniature scores that my uncle gave him. Right. Of everything, Beethoven, Mozart, 
you name it. Yes. And he would read the scores, you know, like, you know, turning the page and listening, 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 you know. You know, it was incredible. Man. Yeah. Wow. So Ronnie, did, uh, did you fall into studio work or was it a? a yeah. Uh, I want, like, I want to get in the studio scene. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing like, I, well, when I got married, yeah, we settled down, you know, and uh, uh, actually, I didn't work for my brother. My brother was doing some stuff. I didn't, my brother didn't use me first. Uh, actually, one of, one of the first people I worked for was Pat Williams, you know, yeah. Yeah. Was, who, who, my brother and Pat were very close, you know. And uh, I started working for Pat. And then I called, I, I made the only phone call I ever made for to, to, to try to get a gig. I called this guy that was, his name is Steve Carmen. He's, mm -hmm. uh, he was like, he was, he used to do an act. He was like, did a very, uh, a Harry Belfonte act, guitar played, you know. He worked with Bobby, accompanied Bobby a little bit. This was before I was with Bobby. And he used to say to me, if you ever come to New York, give me a call, you know? And I called him. I said, oh, Steve, how you doing, blah, blah. He said, yeah, can you do a recording with me, blah, blah, blah. Next week, uh, we're doing a film, you know, a cheap, cheap film, you know. They call them nudie films. He was doing nudie films, yeah. And uh, so I said, can you do this? I said, sure, you know, then he started using me, man. And he, he became the hottest jingle writer in New York, really? bar none, man. He was the hottest and I did all of his work, all of it for years. And that, and that, and then I worked with other people, you know, I was working with, but, but he used to call me his contractor would call me and give me dates way ahead of time. Hold on to Thursday from one to four. Hold on to Tuesday, you know, from, from uh, you know, six to nine or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And he would give me, he'd give me holds and then they'd call in the date when he got it, you know. But he would hold his rhythm section, yeah. you know. That's, so you'd, you know, you'd travel you know, from one one day to another in a particular day. You got a three. To oh yeah, we were running, man. It was we were seeing what was great in those days in the in the seventies in the, in New York was all the studios were most of them were close. You could walk to them. You could walk from one studio to another or hop in a cab for you know just uh, five minutes and you'd be at the next studio. You know, it was, everything was close. Everything was all like in, centered in Midtown, you know. Uh, and then uh, that all ended, man. It there's, you know, there are no studios left in New York, man. Oh I'm telling you, man, there's a rehearsal, a couple of rehearsal studios. Right. There's, there's, there are no recording studios, man. The big rooms, Tony Bennett, the big rooms, everybody recorded in, you know, uh, Steve and Edie record. They're all gone. All those studios are gone, man. Uh, they, they tore them down. It's like, and there's no jing, hardly any jingle work anymore. And there used to be a ton of it. I mean, I bought my first house, man, with residuals, you know. Right. And, and uh, it was like, it just didn't stop, you know. And I, I was young, you know. I had a lot of energy. We could run around, you know. Right. And uh, but that all ended, man. And then people started taking gigs on Broadway because the bands on Broadway were not that good in the old days. Now, man, the bands on Broadway are terrific because these guys are out of work. They're good players, right? So they're taking gigs. They, they're happy to get a Broadway show, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus, you get your pension, you know built up from a Broadway show, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you went in to do like, uh, 
a studio date, most of the time you didn't know what it was for. Is that no. correct? And if it's it was okay. like a soap commercial or something like that, would you ever hear the final product? Like would the singers be oh, there? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. I, I, well, sometimes, uh, some, some, in the old days, they used to bring the singers in later to track. They'd put a track, they'd sing to our track. We'd be leaving, packing up and they'd come in and they'd put the singers on. But, but I mean, Steve Carmen sent me a, this jingle writer, he sent me a, 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 a CD of all the stuff that I did with him. Oh my God. <laughs> all of this stuff. And man, we did stuff with Ella Fitzgerald. We did stuff with Satchmo, Louis mm -hmm. Armstrong, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sitting there behind the drums and there's Louis, <laughs> you know, singing about a tires, Goodyear tires or something, <laughs> you know? And Ella singing uh, uh, some tunes, swinging, all swinging, all swinging, you know, mm -hmm. swinging stuff, you know. But that was a highlight for me, you know, in that business was playing with them, man. That was like, that. oh, man, it was like, it was like you know, uh, there was a thing in there. I, I remember uh, there was a scene with Louis standing there and uh, uh, one of the agency people, is asking Louie to play a, a, a turnaround coming out of something. Yeah. And Louie is just kind of like smiling, you know, uh, not really saying much. And the conductor's trying to talk about it, what he, and Louis, yeah. And finally, one of the guys, no, nobody knew what was happening. And one of the guys in the band, the trombone player, yells out, he says, hey, man, that's Louis. Louis invented what you're asking for. Just let him play. And it was true, man. He invented <laughs> what the guy was asking for, you know. And Louis just, oh, you know, he was so nice, you know. He just did it, you know. Like, I, I remember a, a certain player that just natural, man, like John Bunch. Remember John Bunch? Yes. Yes. John Bunch. He used to get nervous when he was on a, on a jingle. He'd get nervous, and and I remember, I was it was me, Jay Leonard, John Bunch. I forget who else. Small band, it's, and Jay Leonard did the same thing with John Bunch. He said, "Just play, just play the way you play, man. Don't, 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 don't let them. You know, they were they were asking him for things to do, yes. and he was getting nervous. You know." And because John usually, you know, he didn't do a lot of recording. He did, he just did all beautiful gigs, you know, like uh, uh, beautiful recordings with good singers. And sure. But Jay Lenhart saved him. I remember Jay says, hey man, just, just play the way, just play it, you know, don't, don't listen to him, just play. Did you ever have um, an ad exec hanging out in the booth? Oh, trying, yeah. to t trying to tell you like oh yes oh yes yes oh yeah yeah it's that's quite it's it's very tricky man it's uh, it's like you know you i'm gonna try to do it whatever they want you know and i and my it's all attitude you know it's like your attitude with the person you know it, it, it's like I honestly want to please this person, you know. You know what I mean, man. You you don't you don't you don't run from it. Right. You kind of like, wow. Let's let's see. Okay, he, I think he likes this. Let me try that. You know, right. and that kind of thing. You know, but nobody ever got got weird or anything like indignant or anything like that. You know, there was they always everybody was always nice. You know. But uh, but then How about the uh, the Copa Cabana recording at the Copa. To, oh, can you tell us about how that came to be and I I you know happened? something I I I wasn't even sure we were recording that night you know <laughs> it was weird man because there was always gear around people's gear and mics and things you know there were all, it was always around 
lights and uh i i just just played the show you know it was like oh you know we're just playing the show you know but i mean the uh i i guess i didn't explain the barry manilow record at the oh. Oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah, I went to California for that. Yeah, were you yeah. his band at the time, or was that yeah, just? Yeah, well, no, no, I was uh, just for the recordings. Oh, I see. I did some recordings with him. Uh, I did it some in New York and some in L.A., uh, and Paul Schaefer was was the leader, and Will Lee playing bass, you know. Yeah, beautiful. He's great, great players, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was some in New York, some some out out uh, in uh, in LA, you know. Any idea? And, and, and originally, it started out where he he wanted Copacabana to be like a Latin thing, right? You know, Barry was at the piano, usually at the piano, uh, and he starts singing. He starts singing Copacabana. You know, he's singing. It's, it's like I don't know, and it's like this, it's like that, and uh, and we we it was Latin, and then they they hyped it up later with with they then they decided I think it was Clive Davis they decided they they wanted it strictly disco, yeah, you know, and then they added stuff onto it, you know, that's the way that came about. I see. But when we originally played it, it was like Latin, you know, mm -hmm. but. Uh, do you, huge do you recall like thinking, oh, this is going to be a hit? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, not particularly that record, but I remember I did Swear to God with Frankie Valley. I'm playing on Swear to God. And that was with a big band. Uh, and I felt like that was, that was something was happening there. You know, I really felt like because actually he tracked, he sang with us, but he didn't record, you know, he sang in a booth right. while we recorded, you know, which was a rehearsal for him also, you know. And uh, I remember it just was, it had a groove happening and there, there was a bass player on it. I forget who it was. Uh, well, Elliot Randall was on that, remember Elliot Randall? guitar player mm -hmm. he's on that uh there's a, there was a percussionist he's no longer with us but uh this bass player i was he he was a bass player that that you played with that you, no matter what kind of music it was it felt great man it could be a polka man yeah it could be a, st a stupid it just, he just had a way of playing that was, you just knew that it was right, you know? It was like, just, this guy just knows, you know? And he was just a, a guy that did gigs around town, you know, big, big black guy, you know? <laughs> nicest guy in the world, man. What the hell was his name? Gordon. Gordon Edwards? Ed Gordon Edwards. Gordon he, Edwards. He was in stuff. You got it, Gordon Edwards. That's right, that's right. Talk Absolutely. about a groove. Oh man, how about that guy? Wow. And not a not a lot of chops. And and uh, another thing about him was he he would he'd be on a jingle or something, and uh, you know a lot of jingle writers they write out everything, you know. And he was a natural player, you know. And he, of course, you don't ever want to give the impression that you don't know how to read, you know. Uh, in a situation like that. And Gordon, <laughs> Gordon would look at the part, you know, oh yeah, yeah, man, oh yeah, oh, well, you know, and he'd <laughs> act like he's, he's reading, but he, he couldn't read that much, but he <laughs> could play the shit out of it. He played the shit out of the music, not the notes, you know. It, it, it's, it's not the notes, my brother used to say, it's the music, mm -hmm. it's not the notes. You don't play the notes, you play the music. Mm -hmm difference between great player and uh, uh, mediocre, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the music. Amazing, man, some, some of those guys, I don't know what happened to Gordon. 
I lost track of a lot of people, man. When the business changed, right. you know, we don't see each other that much. We used to see each other on dates, you know. Doris Mancuso says you were a great impressionist. Uh. <laughs> like an explanation my father thought so too i used to impersonate his brothers <laughs> <laughs> oh Fran, um, sammy was funny man he had a great sense of humor sammy oh, he sure did wow. oh jesus you learn a lot from people like that man so I now think... uh, uh frankie valley comes in like oh yeah burning stone casino where i I used to do contracting. They used uh -huh. to the contract for all the acts that came in. Yeah, yeah. But nobody left. <laughs> but uh -huh. he would come in, and at some point, yeah. everybody would come in with the computer. Oh, yeah. All yeah. right. So all the tracks, yeah. everything is on the computer. They'd play. Yeah. But at some point, you know, like know. Frankie know. Valley and some of those high parts, oh, sure, he'd just push up his track. Yeah, yeah, and, and that was that. And and uh, virtually every act that came through uh, uh, turned in that direction. I where mean, was where was this? Where was this now? At Turning Stone Casino up here. Oh, oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, in Vernon, Ver Verona, okay. you know. And I see. Big showroom and a big. Yeah, yeah. You know, so for years contracting those acts, Man. they would come in and play like Aretha Franklin and very yeah. like yeah. that. And little by little, you'd see the computer. The drummer would have the laptop, yeah, and he'd be yeah. pushing up tracks and with the headphones, and yeah. you know. And you, you know, man, I bought I bought a Lin drum machine when they first came out many years ago. Yeah, because people were asking me if I programmed, right? Oh, you know, do you have a machine? Did you, could you do you have a machine? You know, and and I. I said, well, and so I went out and bought one, you know, it's yeah. like for $2,800 or something, you know. Yeah. Fantastic sounds in Lynn drum machine, the old Lynn. Yeah. I still have it. <laughs> so I, I, I would go to a date and play, play, and then I'd take the drum part and go home, get the machine out, and try to program what I played, ah. you know? Yeah. And I, I did it for about a, two weeks. And I, I just put it away one day, man. I said, I, I got to look. I still work. I still want to play. Yeah. I still, I still, I'm still learning how to play the drums. What am I learning now? You know, pressing buttons, you know. It, it, it had nothing to do with, with our makeup as a person, you know. And I put it away, man. And I just, and then it took over. There were guys that were doing dates, man. You know, there were a couple of mediocre drummers that bought drum machines, man. It made a lot of money, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and they they programmed well. They did. They 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 knew what they were doing. You know, right. I'm terrible with technology, man. I'm, as you can, as you know. <laughs> well, we're here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying it. It's great. Yeah. What a hang. Great hang, man. Yeah. And some of these acts like Cher and um, <clears throat> Roberta Flack. Yeah. Was it was it was it a memorable experience or just one more day? Uh, uh, I I I. Roberta Flack was nice. Yeah. Uh, that was I got to meet oh, a great drummer. I was on a couple tracks and he was on another tracks. He's a great player. Oh, oh I forgot his name. Jeez. Uh, anyway, we hung out a while. You know, I hung out with this drummer a lot on the gig, you know. But, you know, playbacks, you know, you sit together and talk. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, there, there, there were, there were some good, great experiences, man. Like, you know, you know what I got to do that I really loved, man? Uh, I used to work, I used to do all of Elliot Lawrence's work, you know, I don't know if you remember Elliot Lawrence. Yes. Definitely. Years ago, we had a jazz band, great jazz band. Anyway, he became uh, a producer in New York and he, he, 
I was on everything he did. And he, he soaps, uh, films, he, he, he did all the music. And, and, uh, and sometimes he would use Tori. Yeah, I'd see Tori. Tori would come in with the music, you know. Say, oh, hey, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, but but the gigs that I did, he used to take a band. Well, he would take the rhythm section <clears throat> to to Washington, and we do the Kennedy Center, man. You know, with with you know the Kennedy Center Honors. Yes. And it was such a great gig, man. And I did about five of them, five or six of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clinton, Bush, who else? Reagan, uh, no, I wasn't. No, I didn't do Reagan. I don't know if it was Reagan. Anyway, um, after the gig, we we'd have we'd go to a dinner, you know, and all all of that it was. I'd take my wife, you know. It was really really a beautiful experience, man. That was a great. And then he lost it. Elliot lost it. Another conductor came in. Of course, they used their guys, you know. And, uh, but it was, it was, it was a great gig, man. The orchestra was great, you know, always, you know, and we'd rehearse, we'd go in, we pre-record a lot of it there, right there, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> but that was, that was a great gig. And, and uh, we do the, we do the Ford theater. There'd, there'd be a, 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 a benefit for the Ford theater uh, every year. And that was great because the president and everybody, the cabinet, you know, it's a, a tiny theater, man. They were all sitting down front on top of us. <laughs> we're on stage and I'm looking at Bush and, uh, you know, this one and that one, you know. And uh, <laughs> geez, it, was, it was fantastic. That was, that was fantastic. But then he lost that gig too. We got everybody got older, you know. We get older, you know. New people come in, and they're great, you know. The great. There's so many drummers around, man. I can't believe it. That that just blow my mind, man. Yeah. Just blow my mind. I'm like, because how does he do that? You know, <laughs> just it's amazing. Do you ever get checks in the mail and you not sure what they're for? Yeah, that's happened to me. Yes, yes. <laughs> and for films, for usually for films, like I, I remember. Oh, I still get a check from uh, what was that the Spielberg movie, uh, Close Encounters, Close Encounters. Okay. Now, now get this. You remember the scene in the movie where uh, he's building a mountain inside of his house? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mashed potatoes, everything. Yeah, right. Right. There's a TV on. And they're playing a Budweiser commercial mm -hmm. that I'm on. <laughs> so I get a check for like 90 bucks every once in a while, <laughs> 85 bucks. You know, at first I didn't know what it was. And then I, then I found out, you know, because it was weird. It was like, I, I didn't do the film. I, I was just on a, the TV was playing in the room while he was <laughs> building a oh, <laughs> It's so beautiful, man. It's weird, isn't it? It's weird. What um, kind of gig um, do you like to play now that has sort of no pressure? Like when you're doing Chicago every night, and yeah, you, yeah. you just have to be so focused. And what kind of gig is the total opposite of that for you? Boy, that's a good question, man. Uh, well, I actually I had a rehearsal band, you know, I had a, I with some good arrangements, and uh, uh, that was fun. I would call a rehearsal, I call up the guys, great players. Everybody would always say yes, I'll be there, mm -hmm. for no money, yeah. for two hours, on a maybe in between shows, you know, and we'd play whatever I'd call up. I was the leader. <laughs> I, let's play number 23, you know? Mm -hmm. And man, like it was, that after that two hours, first of all, 
everybody always showed up. Nobody canceled or anything. I mean, I mean, great players, man. Bobby Porcelli, great uh, alto player. He used to get, I, he would get saxophones, and uh, man, like uh, just just all, all great players, man. Yeah. And, and it was, and and they would want to play longer. I only had the room for two hours. It was at the Union, by the way, yeah. which is closed. Our Union is closed. Oh, We're waiting for it to open. So I could bring in my band again and rehearse because they have a, a great room with drums, and, you know. Not only me, everybody wants to do it. But but then I would play with other bands too, uh, uh, rehearsal bands that was fun. There was no pressure. You know, you're sight reading, but it, it doesn't matter. There's, there's no audience, there's no, you're just by yourselves there playing. Right. Might be a few people hanging out, you know, yeah. but, uh, that that was fun, but to tell you the truth, man, I want to go on a gig and play some tunes, man. Right. I just want to play some. I want to play all the things you are. <laughs> play, you know, I, I mean, you know, I just want to play some tunes, man. Right. Good good tunes. Sure. Just just ding ding a ding, you know. Well, you I don't want any you. solos or anything. <laughs> Come on up to Utica. We'll play some dang, dang, a dang. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, it's, 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 it's amazing. Well, I'm, I'll tell you, man, my chops are so strange now from playing the show, man. I have a lot of bad habits because of the way I'm set up, things like that. And I got some arthritis coming in, you know, uh, but I can still play the show. I can still play and play pretty strong yet you know fast i'm not i'm caledonia is over for me man. <laughs> i did that with woody for two years man and northwest passage you know you know it's like crazy woody wanted everything fast you know um, but that's a great band leader man woody was a great band leader great guy man i boy miss him and uh i did five albums with him you know first album was my kind of broadway we did all these broadway tunes mm -hmm. but he had charts in there from bill holman and uh, uh oh nat pierce did a lot mm -hmm. you know all, all good music man very good music and uh then there, there was did did, you, did some, live at Antibes or something like that? Pardon me? Was it there's a live thing you did? Uh, and, and oh, yeah, Antibes. Yeah, Antibes. And, and Antibes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I, that We didn't get paid for that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did that. And uh, that's about it, man. But Woody was a great experience for me. See, that's another thing. When I got off of Woody's band and I came to New York, let's get that guy that was that was with Woody. Right. That's the way it went, man. Mm -hmm. it, it just does. They they hear you. They're playing a Woody Herman record on the on the radio locally, you know, in the jazz station. People hear other musicians hear it, you know, and they they say, Oh, well, let's you know. I was getting gigs just because I was with Woody. Man. Actually, I got more mileage out of Woody than Bobby Darren. Really? You know, in other words, because the musicians were more impressed and the writers with somebody from Woody's band than with Bobby, I guess. You know, I don't know. Although they 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 liked they loved Bobby, you know, and some of the stuff. You know, it was great. He, he, he didn't want to swing all the time, man. Swing. He, he was right on the right on it, man. You know, I used to do this thing at Three Rivers Inn with him. I, I don't do it anymore, but because I'm not playing that kind of music that much. You know, you know, when the drummer sneaks in, you know, when you're playing, yeah, yeah. You're playing, and you sneak in. Mm-hmm. Soft, 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 soft. Yeah. He never heard that, man. 
and he flipped over it. <laughs> and he went after it a while. He'd go, sneak in, sneak in, you know, while he's on stage. <laughs> and, you know, I wouldn't be playing. He'd just sneak in, sneak in, man. Sneak in. And then just <laughs> soft symbol, just soft symbol. Even no hi hat, man. That all of a sudden, no hi hat, maybe cross stick, you know. They, they, he went nuts over that. And it's all <laughs> stuff that I heard on my in the jazz records, man. You right. know, all the stuff we listened to, man. Mm -hmm. You know, Blakey and, uh, you know, Philly well, Joe. What were your big, biggest influences in terms of drummers? Oh, man. Uh, well, Philly Joe really, uh, Billy Boy, man. Yeah. I mean, listen to that one. Yeah. You know, what, what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Billy Boy, man, and uh, oh, man. Uh, Art Blakey, man. In the very beginning, Art Blakey was just a, just a thundering, man, you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, oh, Kenny Clark, man. Mm. Brushes, Kenny Clark. What a player, man. Yeah. Uh, I love Billy Higgins, though, too, man. Billy Higgins yeah. and yeah. Buddy. I was on the phone with Frank DeVito last night. My cousin was a drummer yes, yes. And from Utica. And and he's like 90 now, 91. We were talking about, every once in a while we talk about Buddy Rich. Mm -hmm. You have to. Right. You just have to. We were talking about... Uh, Buddies, well, you know, certain things he did, man. We, you know, uh, the feel he got where other people tried doing it uh, of, in that era and they couldn't quite do it like he could do it. You know, he was, he was like a magician, man. And he never, he never messed up, man. He never got hung up on anything. Yeah. No matter what he tried to play, he could play. Yeah, it was like it was just like a miracle, man. Yeah, to watch it, you know. And Frank, uh, he was pretty good friends with him, you know. Uh, and Buddy, uh, he was a character, man. And he, he was over at Frank's house one day, and Frank is—he's got a pair of drumsticks on a coffee table, right? And. Uh, so, so Frank says, hey, buddy, what, what is that? What, what is that you do there? You, you, buddy picks up the stick. What are you talking about, man? You know, buddy was like, crass, you know. I'm, man, man, man. So Frank tells me, he picks up the sticks and he starts playing all this shit on the coffee table. <laughs> just, it, it blew his mind. He said, hey, just paired it all. You know, you know, he was like, he just tossed it like it was nothing. You know, like, and I get a kick out of that then star story. Yeah. Well, Ronnie, I've got a kick out of this hang. Yeah, Great beautiful. Hang, beautiful. Hey, if, one thing: if I if I don't say hello from Pete Procopio, I'm gonna. Oh, be... Oh man, yeah, you too. Please say hello to him. For me. Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah, Pete. <laughs> Another... There's a trumpet. There's a trumpet player in the band. Uh, Glenn Drews. Glenn, sure. Did you know Glenn? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And he, that band, he, our band, he does a lot of stuff in New York. You know, he's the lead trumpet player in, in the show I'm doing. And uh, every once in a while, he calls Pete up and puts me on the phone. Oh, once no. in a while, when we're, ha we're having a couple of drinks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the last, last conversation I had with, I ended it with Pete. I can't play fast anymore, man. <laughs> he says, "Who wants to play fast?" He says, "You know, you know, you get like, it's like after Woody, man. I, I, I got to the point where I could play real fast, you know. And that when you don't, if you don't do it, you lose it." You know, right, right. It's, it's you know, yeah. well, this has been great. This Thank has you. been great. Well, I agree. You're, I agree. Really, you're really, really easy to talk to, man, and uh, great questions, too, man. <laughs> well, it's a gas having all uh, you two together at the same time. No, oh, I love this. The way, yeah, the way you set this up, man, this is yeah, beautiful. 
Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, terrific. I'm going to pause our recording here, and then we'll uh, we'll say goodbye. Okay. All okay. right. So I'll just sit where I'm at, right? Okay. You're good. Okay. We're good. All right.